I've been thinking about this as a geometric Langland, which, which was a name attached to something that I really disliked. <laughs> uh, and I was always a little embarrassed by it. And I've been thinking about it by for about three years, and good fortune has it that I more or less came to the conclusions I wanted to reach, which aren't very general, last week. So it's a little rough. Uh, now, I have written up notes, and if you look on my website, you can read the notes for today's lecture, tomorrow's lecture. And there is reference there to a partially written paper, which is not there. But if you think you'd like to read it, because a lot of the calculations are there, you may ask me for a copy. But only if you think you'd like to read it and can read it. <laughs> no, I mean, that's, that's a serious matter. You, when you look, I would guess that at the paper and title, you will understand that most people will not be able to read it. I mean, this is not because they don't know any mathematics. It's something else. <laughs> I, I, I indulge the fancy of mine in writing the paper. That's that's all. So where are we? Uh, let me begin here. Um, there, for, there are three kinds of theories, right? There's the famous uh, Rosetta Stone of Ve. Rosetta Stone of Ve indicates that three, it was a fancy of Ve actually, there are three things that run more or less in parallel. One is uh, algebraic number theory. And then I think about 1880, Dedekind and Weber understood and explained that the theory of, of Riemann surfaces, which had a different origin, could also be formulated in terms, in the same terms as algebraic number theory in particular. So, and they wrote a rather long paper on it. And then, of course, I think it's, it's just, but they, I think, like to think, of course, that the theory over finite fields, curves over finite fields, was a fitting third member of that group. And that's fair enough. So that means, the result is that that means there are really three kinds of theory of automorphic forms. There's the classical theory, so the theory over number field. And according to my principles, there are three fundamental objects. That's the, the automorphic Galois group on the one hand and the motivic Galois group on the other. And all the problems, many of the problems suggested are simply the fact that, whoops, excuse me, that if you get in the right direction, that there's a homomorphism from this group onto that group. And, and that seems to me, uh, says in a few words, what the problem is. Now, so that's the number field. And then the second one, let's say the second one, the one in the middle, is function field over finite field. And I must confess, I mean, this of course is a very, I mean, this is saying something very, very difficult in very few words, function field over finite field. And then I confess I don't have anything to say about it. I think, to, uh, I just, have to read the, what the younger Leforg has written. He seems to have some ideas in the matter. So I, I don't want to say anything about that today. My real topic today is the third. So this is a theory over Riemann surfaces. Now, I want to say right away that I'm only going to consider the unramified theory. And I'm going to be very special, you'll see, in a minute. But as you will see, as I think I'll try to explain, the whole situation is much clearer to me now than it was three years ago. 
than it was two weeks ago for that matter. But <laughs> uh, so it's unramified. That's, that's implicit in everything I say. And it's a theory in which you will not see a stack. You will not see a sheaf. That may or may not be a relief to you. Some people will be disappointed, others not. You will only see eigenvalues of Hecker operators. So, so it's a it's a theory about eigenvalues of Hecke operators. It's an L two theory. I think, in contrast to everyone else in the room, my initial training in mathematics was a functional analysis. So maybe Jim Arthur is in the same boat. But so it's only eigenvalues of Hecke operators. Basically. So I, I want to say one is can sometimes be careless about this. Um, Frankel, for example, in his full key talk, adds a fourth category. But there's a danger here when you're treating this subject to slip over into physics. And he has slipped <laughs> over into <laughs> physics. <laughs> and, and, I, and I think. No, there's nothing wrong with it. It's perfectly legitimate, but you should be careful. Right? It it's blurs the edges. And, uh, but there's one thing that does play a role. That's what those are the Yang Mills equations. So that does play a role, but that can be that's differential geometry. Uh, okay. So actually, so let me just see it here. Uh, there are, I can't read, unfortunately, these glasses. So the choice is to see you or to see this paper. <laughs> so the are two things. The, you have to have a, the theory of. Uh, you really have to write down something. Understand the eigenvalues of Hecke operators. Now the Hecke operators don't have eigenvalues. The Hecke operator in the geometric theory gives you at each point a conjugacy class. So what it gives you is a conjugacy class that moves from point to point as you move over the uh, Riemann surface. So these are conjugacy classes. We will be primarily interested in GL2, and so there are two by two conjugacy classes of two by two matrices. So this conjugacy class, you can think of, is actually uh, is a unitary conjugacy class. It lies in G of 2. There doesn't seem to be any, in the geometric case, at least GL2, uh, the Ramanujan uh, conjecture seems to be valid. I didn't know about that. So. So, so the Hecke operators; those have to be described. Now, there's no functoriality. There's no reciprocity in uh, this theory, apparently. What there, what there seems to be is uh, a, a complete description. Of what I call the automorphic Galois group. So this is a this is a group whose representations in a given G L parameterize the automorphic forms on the given group G. Now, so now you'll see that I'm going to be doing these things in a very restricted context, but um, let me just see. So. There's another point that I want to mention that uh, I won't discuss today, but really needs to be discussed. And I should say that you'll see, you won't see, but I, I admit it right away, that the two papers which have most influenced me are paper of a Tiabot, and that's what I want to mention now. They introduce a group that they call 
gamma sub r. So they're working on a general Riemann surface, and ultimately, I, I mean a compact Riemann surface. I won't be doing that ultimately. Gamma r, and this gamma r classifies the Yang-Mills connection. Uh, so we'll be dealing with the case that the group is GL2. Now, what happens is, now, is that the eigenfunctions of the Hecker operators are basically, this is, this is somewhat irrelevant, but it, I mention it because it's, it's important, it's intuitively integrals of Yang-Mills connections. These conjugacy classes I get by integrating a connection and so that this gamma r, this is not quite true, but is basically, one has to be careful, but it's not, that's not a precise statement. It's basically mapped onto gamma automorph. It has a, it obviously, there are some, <laughs> there's more here than here simply because a connection may not be integrable to a function that moves around and always staying with it so that when it comes back where it started, it's at the right conjugacy class. So there, there are more Yang-Mills connections in our gamma. But in fact, as far as I can see, a Yang-Mills connection is in this context, the context of Riemann's surface, is simply a constant connection. So if you ref if it's an elliptic curve, you realize uh, the quotient of the plane, you have a canonical flat metric, and it's just, just a constant function. So that means the connections are just constant function, and the gamma automorphic are just given by exponential integrals of the constant functions. Okay. What? When I say in U two, I mean all. I mean, uh, I'm group is GL two, yes. but the eigen the are unitary, right? In other words, Ramanujan conjecture is tr so to speak trivially true. Uh, the unitary. So U2 is just unitary group in, th in two variables. I mean, I'm thinking of GL2, the unitary group in two variables. Okay. So, and there's, so I, I won't mention this connection with Yang Mills, but it's certainly there. Now, um, the second paper to which is it, is, oddly enough, another paper of Atiyah, and he, class, he, he actually gave a precise description of fungi for G equals GL2, which is the ca only case in which I really know everything. I don't. I, I actually sent a copy of my lecture notes to, to Atiyah, who wrote back. That he's very pleased to uh, see that his results have used. But it, it was Sunday or Sabbath, and on the Sabbath he couldn't print it out. <laughs> so he, he couldn't print it out. He said, I, I was curious to see which, wi what papers A and AB were. <laughs> I never heard from him after that. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now let me try to start. So. The description of a tier, when you look at it, is also a description for GLN, but let me do it for GL2. So you want to describe Bungi. Now, I mean, Bungi, of course, has a rather peculiar topology, uh, but its topology is completely irrelevant, as far as I can see. Its structure is, to some extent, relevant. I mean, uh, you know, points aren't closed and things like that. In, in the, in the, but it's geo nonetheless, its differential geometric properties are important. All right, so let me just see. Okay, so a tier has a classification, and the classification consists of two pieces. One is D, and these are the directs. So I'm now basically confining what I'm going to do, because the only case I can really treat is GL2, and I can do GL2 for reasons that I explained, thanks to Atiyah's um, 
classification. I can't, a tier does a classification for GLN. And uh, one should be able to go to GLN. The advantage of GL2 is that one can easily, in GL2 one can tell, at least I can tell, when a bundle is re reducible. In GL2 bundle, I can't, I'm a, I, it may be possible, but I myself have no way of telling, at the moment at least, when a GLN bundle is reducible. And that's important. And so the, um, these are the reducible bundles. And this is one piece. And then there's the second piece, which is in once they're sometimes decomposable, in decomposable. And the indecomposable bundles are described by their degree. So there's a degree 0, 1, 2, minus 1, minus 2, and so on. And one goes up in ten steps of 2 by tensoring with line bundles. I'm, yeah, I should say that, yes, I, I, I'm over an elliptic curve. Okay. I, 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 a no one ever tried, any general theory demands doing something over a general curve, but I'm using a tier, and it was all I could do to get, the, uh, to get elliptic curves. No, no, I'm sorry, I didn't mention that. Um, so it's an elliptic curve, but it is a curve, so tensing with line bundles takes me in, in for GL2 bundles up two degrees. So there are types of M, M plus one, or types M, M. And uh, these, have the, these ones have the advantage that the determinant is one to one. So you take the determinant of the bundle, go to the line bundle, the determinant is one to one. And here it's the determinant is four to one. What? Oh, uh, if, it were, if it were reducible, it would be one and another, and this is just a convenient convention. Hmm? Just, just one, my way of thinking it. So there's, there are indecomposable bundles of each degree, each even degree, each odd degree, right? And the each, the each of them, looks like the, uh, well, in this case, an elliptic <coughs> curve looks like the curve itself. The parameter is the curve itself, and a, a distinctive feature is that the determinant is one to one here for odd degree, and it's four to one. Um, I, what we'll see is that, wh what, it seems, what it comes down to is that calculations or examination of these things demands a very careful combinatorial analysis, and you have to, you have to be very careful about this distinction, four to one. If you look, there's something similar for bundles of arbitrary degree and then for bundles, for GLN bundles or for arbitrary N, then, so to speak, we have a ladder going all the way up and odd is different from even and for bundles of general uh, rank, then it, it goes up, I mean, the complete move is up N and then each, each in, the intermediate stages depend upon the relation between the degree and N. And that means that w one is dealing here with combinatorics, right? Uh, so in the calculation. So uh, this, so basically here I said odd degree, one gets away with that in, in, in when making various, and examining various things. For even degree, you have to look more carefully at this. And I just tell you, now I do something else. 
which uh, Matia Boyd, but I don't think that makes him more readable. Name is I use the theory of elliptic Weierstrass elliptic function, so I can see things, right? And in in particular, one one of the functions that appear in the Weierstrass theory is zeta. Zeta is not quite periodic; it has a pole, and it's not it has a pole at, at zero, and it. So this is just, I mean, given that omega 1 or 2 omega 1 and 2 omega 2 are, of course, the side of the uh, parallelogram that defines the elliptic curve. And so this, and for given sides, you have zeta and the cis for the one side and a similar thing for the other side. And the functional equation that the zeta function occur satisfies is this, where eta 1 and eta 2 are determined by omega 1 and omega 2. And this has a pole at, uh, when its function is z, at z equal zero. So the bundle is given by, we like S at If you check, if you check, you just think about it for a moment, thanks to this functional equation, if I move in either of these directions, I multiply this thing this matrix on the right by a constant matrix. So this defines a, a bundle. So in this unfortunate case where the determinant is 4 to 1, I have a precise description. The deter I, what is it? It's the, the, the bundles in question are line bundle times S. And I lose something when I take the determinant because I take the determinant of the line bundle and there are four line bundles of Rank two with determinant one. All right. So that's the space. Now you, you see we're treating A and B are quite different. I, if you start to be, if you think about stacks, then you A, B, A has a, the closure of A contains part of D and so on. But for us, A and D will be surprisingly separate. Uh, so there are two, there are two HECA operators. Well, there are more. So X is a point. The O of X are the integral, integral or the things given by formal power series. ZX inverse 0, 0, 1. G of x, this is one, and the other one is delta 2 of the, yeah, G of o x. Now, so, and actually, I confess I cheated in making my calculations. I assure you the calculations with HECA operators are fastidious and, to some extent, dull. But uh, what? There's something in dull. What is the first word? Fastidious. Fastidious. No. Delicate. You meant care, delicacy, and they seem a little too much, right? I mean, you're, you're making calculations, and uh, calculations uh, have to be made with care. And they offer some surprises, though. So the, I want to stress here, uh, because the, I mean, you can guess what the HECA operator associated to this is. The HECA operator associated with this takes F to F prime where f prime of g is equal to the integral over h of g delta, uh, it's delta 1, I guess, f of h dh. So that is the Hecker operator. And 
to, to once surprise this heck operator is goes given by a correspondence. But the correspondence is always a one point for the finite set. So it's a very, yeah, it's hard to believe. Hard <laughs> and it's troubling. You'll, you'll see that it's troubling. Where does G? Yeah. G, these, uh, these functions are functions on, on bungee. Okay. So bungee, I should, I remind you, is, uh, is of course, G of A over G of O divided by G of F, right? So the two by two matrices, and write out this side, I divide out that side. And what? What does it correspond to what? Geometrically. Well, you have to look at it. I mean, I tell you something. Uh, you t you it's a correspondence, right? Oh, no, it's a vector bundle. Yeah, that's what I was just saying. What? What? what where am I? Wor oh, this, these are vector bundles, yes. Oh, okay. All right. Just standard way to parameterize a vector bundle. Just this. I mean, here's an example. Huh? Um, so now there. So I, I'm going to have to have a measure here. Now there is, if you look at the tier plot, there's a there's a metric, a reasonable metric on bungee in spite of its disagreeable properties, and so uh, I well the only natural thing to do is, you know, in introduce the Floppian. And define a metric in the usual way. And so then you have to deal with, in principle, you have to deal with the Gau uh, was it, uh, Chern Gauss Bonnet theorem. But on, the, on, a, on a singular variety. Now there's a paper that Goreski, who's unfortunately not here today, uh, I mean, he has a paper, he has something written with an, somebody named Alupi. So that promises to be difficult, right? Uh, uh, you, ha you need a gauss bonnet theorem. I think there is a gauss a gauss bonnet theorem for singular varieties, and uh, well you have to learn that, make sure you apply it well, and so on. Fortunately, for our particular case, that's always a finite set. Right. So it's not hard to define with using the Fafian, the measure on a finite on a finite set. A finite set, the metric is of course easy, and so every point has a me measure one. So I, I tell you, I mean, I, it's it's somehow an aside, but the, you do you, when you want to check. That the uh, hack operators have the you know, relation between them that you expect. Your initial impulse is to examine this kind of thing locally, and I must confess that when you, I had several at some point a little more than a year ago, I had several weeks of, of anxiety because the local proper it, 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 this the fact that this reduces. For Bunchy, for for Jill to to a set of points over which you're integrating, it makes the difference. You can see it's otherwise you just don't know what to do. And uh, I, I remind you of this because I received a message from someone just the other day, and he said, "Well, I hear you've done something, and uh, I, I would like to know what you've done because I have a similar method, and I hope I can apply it." And then I said, "I, I look, picked up, I printed out his paper." And I l looked it up, and he thinks seems to say that he thinks a local study. There are an extent of local studies of such integrals are completely irrelevant to the global situation because the global situation simplifies considerably. Okay, so I say that in passing. Oh yes, and then then there's a second point. I'm not going to present the calculations because, well, as I say, if you. They are. They will be present in the paper that I'm writing, 
so you can check them there. But they're also, I repeat myself, fastidious. They take a lot of care and a lot of time. And uh, now, now let me explain something because they take a lot of care and a lot of time and you discover something, or you have to make a choice. And this is the following. You have, as I say, uh, the bungee is made up of two pieces, DNA, which although A has, there are some limits of A and D that is ir irrelevant, but D is two-dimensional. And A is one dimensional. Right. So if I reduce dimension by one, and I think of the heck operator as being given by a matrix, it will look like this. Right? Zero dimensional and one. But it's one and two. And that I'm, I'm, I'm have, I have a heck operator, and it appears to mix up functions on these two spaces. Um, and I suppose, I mean, you can't, you wouldn't guess this. So, <laughs> you, so th the matrix looks like this. Let me write the matrix in this situation. Why I have, why I use one dimension and, and zero dimension, right? And it, it mixes them up. What? The heck operator. The heck operator. Uh, axon L2, I mean, I'd not, I could define the, I gave the formula up here for what the heck operator does. So, but the heck operator is a correspondence, and the correspondence mixes up these two spaces. Right? But, so if uh, it defines a matrix, <coughs> that means the matrix has off di diagonal entries. They look like this. In other words, what the matrix, the matrix off diagonal ent entries are taking functions on this space, the functions on this space, functions on this space, and functions on that space. So now this is, I, I reduce the dimension by one so I can picture it. The matrix takes a point and just puts it up here. So this is the full function down here, and the heck operator is trying to make it into a full function in an L2 space concentrated at a point. Well, there are full functions in L2 spaces which are concentrated at points, and they're equal to zero, right? It's L2 of a measure. If I take L2 of the line and take a point which is one at zero and zero every place else, for L2, it's zero. And you notice the same on the other way. Well, by if this is got does nothing, then because the heck it's operators are permission, this should do nothing. But also you see it's trying to take something which is known, an L2 function on a one dimensional space and it's trying to tell you what it is at a point. It can't do it. So, so you're faced with a decision. <laughs> Either you have no theory at all, huh? <laughs> or you throw, you decide that this part and this part are irrelevant. Huh? Now, You know, <laughs> it's like a Catholic boy who eats meat for the first time <laughs> on Friday. You, you have bad feelings afterwards. <laughs> Nonetheless, it, it, it seems to work. The point is, it does seem to work. It gives a coherent theory. All right, so uh, that I want to stress. Okay. So, so really, the the. The point is that when two and one and zero are replaced by two and one, the uh, Hecker operators separate D and the functions on D from the functions on A. Um, it does not mean that some eigenvalues don't appear in both places. And, uh, uh, these are some uh, functions on here, are some uh, the, the, the uh, analogs of cusp forms and on D analogs of Eisenstein series. Pardon? Yes. What is the nature of space? What? Oh, okay. space is an L2 space, right? right. The, space is, the space is an L2 space, but 
I mean, uh, uh, if I may start by saying, it really doesn't matter. What you have to use a measure. You have to use a measure on D and on A to define. So it's a functions on D or functions on A. You have to introduce a measure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I'm going to tell you about I know what the spectrum is. But the spectrum doesn't really depend on what you can what on the measure you take, right? Yeah, I can change the measure at the same L2, a different L2 space, but the eigenfunctions are the same. They are, but the measure is not the measure of eigenfunctions. The measure of eigenfunctions are the spectrum. Say this is. Well, what are the Eisenstein? I, I, what are the Eisenstein theories in this connection? I don't have any Eisenstein theories to offer you. You, I, I, you see, I tell you, I read the papers of I mean, Russo American School, whatever it is, and they don't mean a damn thing to me. I, I just don't know where these people are going. They speak of Eisenstein theories, but I don't have any Eisenstein theories. <laughs> now, I, I, mean, I have them in retrospect. I have this continuous spectrum. But the functions <laughs> I will give you. My question was the yes. Yes. Okay. Oh. That's how that spectrum is based. Is it time estimation? What? Space of what? You said all oh, your point is time estimation. So L2, what space is that? The space is 1G. 1G is the union of the elliptic curve multiplied by, by Z, Z. All right. The, and the, the D part is the elliptic, basically the elliptic curve itself, again multiplied by the degree. So what does it look like? I know you said it's elliptic. Well, do I have to tell you what an elliptic curve looks like? No, no, no. <laughs> I mean, uh, 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 I think you're saying that the union of components initially is isomorphic to the elliptic curve itself. I said, yes, if I, if I take the product of the elliptic curve with Z, with Z I then I get a union of the curve itself. So that's what's special about elliptic curves. Uh, yeah, 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 but it's it's the fact that bundles have degrees, right? Okay, and and that's it. Uh, yeah. And, and so when you do components, so now we have an H space, we have an elliptic curve, and G. What does the A and D part have to do with it? The D part is on the is the D part is on two, if I may say, two copies of uh, the. I just a minute, I have to look. I forget. I forget names. So I forget who is it. Who is it? Who is this gentleman? He's not uh, Abel. He's not uh, Jac Jac Jacoby. He's someone else. It comes came later. <laughs> Picard. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, so you're dealing with basically, in, in the one case, the D, you're dealing with the product of the Picard variety with itself. With the A, you basically, it's not quite true, but you're basically dealing with the Picard variety, that's the, and, and just one copy of the Picard variety, and the motion from from Z to Z to from Z to Z plus one is a little bit more complicated. Okay, so you should just think of the elliptic, the two copies elliptic curve, and one copy of the elliptic curve, and then one or two dis discrete uh, z's. All right, so so there's where we are. I mean, uh, you, you know, the eigenvalues usually don't depend upon the uh, upon the measure you use, right? You can use, you can take, the, you can introduce new measures on the line, and the eigenvalues will still be e to the i x y, right? So uh, they, the, eigen, the eigenfunctions rather don't recognize, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's just that it be absolutely continuous with respect to the the big measure and vice versa. So, uh, as I said, I took a chance. I just threw away that. And I I it's puzzling at first. It's, not, it's not, a, not a chance you take readily, but it does seem to work. It gives a coherent theory. Fairly, fairly, very simple, well-defined eigenfunctions. And what? If you take the multiple of two prime, 
Yeah, that's certainly, yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, what you're throwing away, if it becomes more and more complicated. I, I, I described this situation, but you know, for the higher order HECA operators that I never considered, I, I cheated a little. I, I took the first two and I said, I, th uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't check whether the other ones, if I defined them properly, are actually given by the usual formulas. But the thing is that you'll have something like this with higher, dim higher dimensions, but the same problem. Okay, now, all right. Okay, so. We have some idea of, of the structure now of these two pieces, D and A. Hmm? Now, you, as I say, in, 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 the, in the reference I gave, the, the, uh, the what happens with the, with the correspondences is explained very clearly. In any case, you can guess that what D is, co D corresponds to the Eisenstein series in the sense that the in the sense that uh, the, eigen, the eigenvalues will be given by pairs, one, one, each, each an eigenvalue for GL1, right? and up to symmetry. That's that. So that's D, and I. So let's forget about it. Now, uh, now I wanted. Do A. Now, A is not bad. Okay, a is easy enough to describe, except it's awfully finicky because of this two. Uh, finicky, that's it. Mm, that's, it. <laughs> <laughs> that's better than fastidious. Yeah? <laughs> Clear. <laughs> so it's, it, it, it's, you have to look at it because you see it's, it's moving. It's moving along in these spaces, and they're, they're, they're of different types. They're slightly different types. So if you look, at, I, I think I explained it very, fairly carefully in these notes. And uh, so l let's just remind us how, how it looks, if I can do it. So the question is, because, well, let me tell you in some sense what, if I can try to explain the answer. The answer is easy, as I said. The the HECA eigenfunctions will be given by matrices. But these matrices so, will be given by ordinary exponential functions on the elliptic curve. So they'll be given by, so I have the elliptic curve, think of it as a rectangle, and I have the exponential functions e to the i nx and e to the i my. Right? So those, it's put uh, together from those, more or less, and of course, there's this extra z coming in, and then I have an extra e to the i n alpha. N is the L n e to the i z alpha, where alpha, if you like, in 2 pi, 0, 2 pi. So I, I, the, the natural functions in this context are these functions, which are characters of this, and these functions. And here, m has, and n has to be integers. And there, it's basically a fun it lies between zero and two pi. So the only thing that it makes it so a, as far as the movement up and down when we move by two, it's it's all right. It's a movement between this and this. So it's a, we we go from m m to m m plus one, and we go from m, m plus 1, if you like, to m plus 1, m plus 1. So we just have to try to see what's happening here. What? Just, uh, well, you can figure out by yourself what, what, the, what, the, what delta 2 does, right? Okay. Uh, all right, so it's delta 1, which is somehow a little tricky. We have, 
uh, we have to think about it. We have to think about the relation between the even and the odd. Hmm? The, the odd, I just need to determine, I mean, on the odd, the determinant tells me everything. So I can, I will think of, on the odd, I'll just have a function of determinant, which, which I can imagine, well, the determinant is, of course, the number is e to the i theta, and I will just take e to the i theta to some integer. I've got too many integers here, but let's call it r. So that will be, so as long as I can describe it by the determinant, I, I know what function to take. I just have to make sure that everything works out. Now, on the other hand, for these, it's a little bit different. These, it's a little bit different. So what I do is, think of this, I sort of, I, I'm, con I'm convinced that it's going to be given on that by e to the i, let's see, mx, I, I'm, I'm this, this replaces two, I should do it this way. Let's, there's this, there'll be something like two pi i mx and e to the two pi i my, well, or, yeah, yeah, n, n, n y. And let's, let me call this an integer b. So this is the x coordinate, this is the uh, y coordinate, this, or the, this is the y coordinate. So there'll be functions of the x coordinate and the y coordinate. There'll be functions, let's go over here. You see, so I have my, there are functions of lambda times this s, and if I take the determinant, this is lambda squared. So the, the case, so lambda squared, I can, functions I get by taking lambda squared are the functions I get by putting, making this even and this even. Uh, so, well that's one possibility. They give me some functions. I, I, they, they give me a class of functions. So um, I can find using, see I have to be careful here. What I want to say is I, I have to look, and I'm convinced that I'm, that here on this, on, on this I'm taking fu periodic functions. So e to the two i i, pi i a x plus two pi i c y. But, but then I go to the determinant and I put in, means I put in a two here and a two here. So I do get, if I'm willing to use the, de use the even things here and the even things here, I can get some things which are functions of the determinant. But that means that if I take some things which are functions of the determinant, then on the basic lattice, they're odd. On the basic lattice, they're even. The, in other words, in the basic lattice, there are four distinguished points, and they, they need characters which are one of these four points. Hmm? So, I, I'm explaining myself, I think, badly, and uh, fortunately, I think I can be able to stop until next time, but it, it, it's this. I, I have, I, I want functions, I, I know what I can do uh, here, and I want to do something here. Now here, if I, if I think basically of the elliptic curve itself, I have two possibilities, I have the possibilities of the way my character acts under multiplication by something whose square is one, namely these these four points. Where am I here? These four these four points points on the elliptic square have either they're two times themselves or one, or one or, or their square is one, depending upon the way you look at it. So they that means, and insofar as I'm thinking of functions which are invariant under 
translation by these four points, I can think of them as functions of the determinant. Right? So I set them aside and I use them together with the, with the things on the even. Then I have to go back and look at those things which are which transform under the under the elements of order two, the elliptic curve, if you like, by a non-trivial character, of which there are three. So I say I those I will look at. They translate, but they're zero on the there's zero on this on these parts coming from even pairs, from equal pairs. So what happens there is the following. Namely, I take them to be characters which uh, have the right behavior under the, this group of order four. Namely, they, uh, they're non-trivial. The restriction to the group of order four is non-trivial. That means it's one at two places, minus one at two other places. And I have this, for the two other places, I have either these two, these two, or these two, these two, or these two. So I have three possibilities. And for those, I have, I mean, I have the characters which have exactly that, that property. They behave just the right way on this. And my functions are given by this lambda s. So I think of them as functions of lambda, not as functions of the determinant, which is given lambda squared. And they give me three, three collections, because I can, I only, I'm only imposing a, a restriction according to the restriction to these four elements. So. Um, what this means is the following. So, and, and you, what you get involved in is a question of what happens when I pass from this to this, or from this to this. And here's what I want, and let me see, let me just, let's say this. I have a correspondent. And the correspondence is, as it turns out, is when I go from here to here, it's four to one. When I go from here to here, it's one to one. So the fact that it goes from four to one, so you see, with this new kind of function I introduced, I, it has no reference to the, the uh, it has no, it's, it's zero, it's zero on the, uh, on the odd elements. And so what happens, as you see, is that because it's four to one, and because I'm taking a character which is non-trivial on the elements of order two, it, it moves the function over to zero as it passes from even to odd. Hmm? Uh, so, so, so what the, I, I, maybe I'll come back to this next time, but the result is the following. We have we get on A, there are four types. Those that refer to, those that are used by applying first the determinant and then taking the, and then, then applying, then applying a character of the, of the elliptic curve. So they give rise to Hecker characters that look like this, eta and eta. So they look like, I mean, Hecker character, remember, is a matrix. So it's a matrix like this, and this is, so this is some, so this is e to the i, this is e to the i a, I do it various ways, 2 pi i a x plus b y, and this is the same thing. Zero. So uh, uh, they're moving. So they're moving around by these uh, periodic functions, in where the parameters a and b are free. So they are a rather rather trivial kind. It's a kind of rather it's a trivial kind of spectrum that we've already that we already meet on D. We could take that on D. 
The others, on the other, and the determinant is right. The other, on the other hand, look like something like eta of x, where eta is a character like that, and then here, minus eta of x. Their sum is zero because the, the, non the first Hecke operator has eigenvalue zero everywhere. That's what I, I the, the funny nature. And the second, and then the second one is just whatever that that, that is, where uh, minus eta squared. I, I I think I better I better have i and minus i. So that and so that's that's the result that the um, I get that I get a which has which is more or less the cusp of a part, and it has something in common, and then it has the other three ones, which are the, the analogs of cuspidal character. Uh, that's not very clear, and I, but you can look at my, at my notes. I would suggest that you look at my notes if you have questions and ask something on the basis of those notes rather than what I've tried to explain. Next time, what I would like to explain <coughs> is why using this I can be introduce this the uh, automorphic Galois groups. I mean the, the, the Galoisian group, if you like, the autom automorphic the Gal Galoisian group. How it looks, why it looks more or less like the uh, like the group used by Atiyah Bott for Yang Mills equations. And then I would just point out that the natural thing to do is to repeat this for a general group on a general curve, but that will not be easy. I, 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 I think that that means you have to do, you have to start by doing, by examining the result of the TIA for GLN a little more carefully. To see if you can decide when bundles are decomposable and when not. But after that, so far as I know, no one, Atiyah wrote his paper in 1957, and, and I've only seen one person who tried, a young Irish girl, uh, who tried to explain what was in Atiyah's paper. No one else, so far as I know, had looked at it. Do you know anyone? Have you seen that paper that he mentioned in 1957? Yeah, you think it's all there? The even cases mean, mean. Uh, uh, yes. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay, because it, I see it so far. I mean, in my experience, it's uh, missing for other groups, um, <laughs> uh, uh, for other groups and for other varieties, anything other than elliptic curves. Oh, okay. I mean, and I will say also, uh, everything I see written, I, I confess this, everything I see written about the geometric Langmann strikes me as being off base. A in other words, it, it's m it has no concrete, I miss at least, I, can, I, I can't see it in any, the concrete Hecke theory. Am I wrong? or? Okay, that, that, <laughs> so I, I will just try to, next time it probably won't take so long, but I will try to describe the, uh, 
the Galoisian group in, in this case, how, how it looks, and, and uh, I'll explain why, what I think should be done in general, but uh, I may or may not be missing something that's in the literature. Thank you.